Welcome to another episode of In Conversation with Alethea. I am your host, Alethea O'Hara Stevenson. In this show, I sit down with amazing individuals from our community who are doing incredible things. This show will educate, it will empower, and it will inspire you. Today, I am delighted to have one of Shelburne's finest, Ed Roman. He is a multi-talented performer, artist, also a multi-talented musician. He has won many, many awards across a multiple spectrum. And today we're here to talk specifically about a unique album called Red Omen. So Ed, welcome to the show. I am delighted to have you. How have you been? Good, my friend and my neighbor. How are you? It's good to be here out and talking about all this in our wonderful community. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. It is so good to see you and so good you to too. have you on the show. Thank you so much for saying yes. Pleasure. So, I read your bio and we've had our pre-conversation and, you know, your bio talks about you're a multi-talented um, artist and musician. What other instruments do you play? I know you play the guitar, but what else do you play? I see the drums behind you. Oh, well, yeah, uh, I mean, I think we're all drummers at heart. We all have, you know, the beat that we walk with every day and the heart that beats in our chest. So there's this, we're born, I think, with that feeling of a connectivity to a pulse. And uh, music is, is a duality. It has this sense of melody and rhythm, obviously, where the Duke Ellington one said, if it got rhythm, it hasn't got anything at all, right? <laughs> so I, I, uh, I, I gravitated to string instruments as a young kid. We had a piano in our house. And I made noise all the time and I was coming up with songs and things like that. But my mom in, in, in due course found out that, you know, I was like pleading for a guitar at a very young age. And and she had a secretary friend of hers that, you know, had an old guitar. And, and I and I got that one year for Christmas. And it like it liberated me because I really wanted to have that connectivity to that instrument. And yeah. I, I, as, as time went on, I became a bass player, you know, in high school, everybody's like, nobody wanted to play the bass, yeah. <laughs> but, but I, I saw it as a whole other challenge because a teacher from another high school handed a buddy of mine, a bunch of records and it, a couple of them were Jocko Pastorius records. And here was this guy playing the electric bass and melodic stuff, doing like Charlie Parker's Donna Lee and, and doing things on the bass that nobody had really ever done before. And I thought, wait mm. a minute, you know, this is pretty cool too. And I, and I, I, I gravitated to that and studied that in college. And that's what I've been sort of doing as, as a musician, as a bass player, but I'm, I'm a songwriter. I play acoustic guitar and that's sort of my, uh, my 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 craft my tool of craft uh i go to that when i'm scribbling and writing because it's, it's easy it's portable i don't need any electricity i always say if the power goes out i always have a job right i love and, it and, and that's that's what i do i've been writing songs my whole life you know okay. and, and yeah that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't know the, um, that background about you. So it paints a wonderful picture. I know, um, you know, just transitioning there, I know that you recently put out an, um, a single called Happiness. I think that came out in 2021. That's what was right. that journey like in the middle of a pandemic? You were here putting out hits. Well, you know what? It was like, uh, I'm just trying to write and be creative and, and do stuff. There's going to be a new single coming out soon again. But that single was just a reflection of the, the need to cathartically release mm -hmm. in, in some way. And, and I'm not ashamed to weep, even when I'm happy, because I find elation through this process. And I'm, I'm driven to tears, as it were, right? Uh, and, and I think it's so healthy to do that. I, I think it's wrong to suppress human emotions. And I, I had this experience where I was on a jury, a forcible confinement weapons charge thing. And, it, it, you know, the jury deliberations can get crazy and people are yelling at one another. And I left the room and I was so upset. I was crying. And, and the judge, she went into her chambers. Right. And she came, she came out with this bag of marbles. Oh. And, and she gave them to me and she said, 
she looked at me in the face, she said, don't ever be ashamed to show your humanity. And she said, and just in case you lose your marbles, here you go. And she gave me this, I'll never forget that. <laughs> Try to bring humor and elation into, into this other situation that was, you know, altogether really hard to deal with. So that song is, has, has, you know, I think really it's a diametrically opposed thing, a yin and a yang, try to find mm -hmm. the positive out of the negative. And we've all been going through so much that, that you know, I've been with friends talking about stuff and, and crying because it's hard. Life experience yes. can be difficult. Absolutely. And I can totally appreciate that. You know, just the world has been in such a chaos, uh, chaotic mess right now that a little bit of happiness helps, right? Happiness goes a long way. So that's sure. incredible. Sure does. Thank you, thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, just talking about your songwriting um, background, the reason that we're here is to talk about Red Omen. And, you know, what is Red Omen? I, I can't help but think that it, it ties into your name. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? And well, you get full points for that and the, and the big snake on the wall, you know, when it comes to the wind, right? Uh, yeah, it's an anagram of my own name. And as a dyslexic, I mean, what people understood dyslexia was, was this sort of perception where words are flipped in certain ways. And what dyslexia really is and what it used to be was that. But what it is, is as we've come to understand it more, a spatial and pictorial comprehensive gift mm -hmm. i'm gonna i'm gonna reframe it as that like like, like like henry winkler you know he always is talking about it's a gift but when a dyslexic is is and this is why so many dyslexics gravitate to the artistic or tactical environments of who we are as people whether that even be playing an instrument or dance or uh, um, being a mechanic or a carpenter you know, things that are really, you know, important and noble in terms of what we can offer to society. So print and I, I you know, reading is important, but it's very two dimensional. And the, the learning experience for me, even as a teacher for many years, being a teacher of music, I understand that, you know, when you're engaging in the instrument, in a conversation, in a process, there's this exchange and other kind of learning going on, just like in a conversation that's character driven. We can learn a lot in print from a text with so much can be misconstrued. Mm -hmm. Whereas like the environment for like a conversation gives to, as I say, these, these sort of heightened colors inside of words and dynamics. Red Almond became a song that I found through the, the process of, you know, artistic epiphany. Uh, it was a story about me the sort of allegories that existed in my life like you know i had this real crazy affiliation with Jimi hendrix and i still mm -hmm. do today uh I, i'm and into the paranormal there's 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 these moments alluding to the song where i'm flying with Jimi hendrix and a ufo to machu picchu and right. but all, but but all of it also has this sort of idea that you know you need to trust in yourself and believe in yourself in, in the video at the, in the clip at the end, there's a part where the character Red Omen falls backwards into a mirror and has to catch himself. Like you have to believe in yourself. And as a dyslexic in the community that I grew up in, in the 70s, growing up in the education system, it was really hard because I had to go to special class. I spent a lot of extra time with my mom practicing reading. She you know, that's one of the reasons she put a guitar in my hands was because she understood that I responded in a positive way to this tactical thing that I was working with. And right. to this day at 85, she's still encouraging me for what I do. Um, so I reached out to uh, my manager and said, look, I really want to try to turn this into an animation. I somehow, and, and for two years, I looked for anybody that would be interested in putting that together, including mm -hmm. co colleges and universities. So I finally found this guy and Nelson Diaz in New York City who put this wonderful video together for me. And at the same time, we reached out to the Dyslexic Society. So here in Canada, through the Davis Dyslexic Society in the United States, we have chapters and, and uh, facilitating offices in every province. Wow. The video then consequently has become a figurehead for the Dyslexic Society here in Canada. But as a result of that, it's shown at like hundreds of film festivals around the world from Moscow to Los Angeles and won an incredible amount of awards and acclamation. But it has brought so much attention to the Dyslexic Society and raised awareness and monies 
That's for kids. Yeah, it's so it's it's what you kind of hope for as an artist that somehow the art goes past liberating you. Right. You know, some, somehow it, it connects in a bigger way to your living environment. Exactly, definitely. I love that. And, you know, you touched on so many gems there, but I want to find out, you know, what made you decide to put yourself out there, to be brave enough to share your gift with the world? My mom and, and, and my family, like, like, it's, you know, so often, you know, we grow food here and I grow a lot of vegetables. And I think that anything you do, my mom and dad said, they may not have understood completely. Right. But they always said, be passionate about what you want to do. I don't care if it's being a brain surgeon, a shoe salesman, or whatever. But but be happy and be passionate about it. So they were always encouraging me to to do it. And I and and you know, growing up with the friend base that I had, we were always challenging each other as young musicians and learning from one another, rival bands, competitions mm -hmm. that you know. And then even in college, it's the same thing. You find it a different level of competitiveness for, for wanting to strive to be better for yourself every day. You right. kind of grow pa that past, that, that place of I need approval. But finding a way to make it work kinetically in, a, in the material world is a whole other story because you can, you can make art all day and that's great. You should be expressive in whatever way right. you, you, you can be, right? Whether it's sandcastle making or doing something with your kids or, you know, it makes life real. And but three, it's, another, three, it's another dimension when you're now able to impact millions, right? You're impacting the world with your music and sharing your special gift with everyone and making it okay. It, and it's okay to do that. That's the thing about the, the, the day and age that we live in, Alethea, is that telecommunications has become so fast and robust that I love watching somebody's human experience. In, from, I follow this woman on TikTok. She works for the walk. It's just a camera over her walk. She's from Taiwan, and she just cooks Taiwanese meals. And I could sit there for like an hour mm -hmm. watching because she is enjoying the experience and sharing it. And Red Omen actually, ironically, is one of those things that the more I gave away, the more that it went out and came back in this feeling like, wow, you know, it's it's bigger than me. It's like, you know, like I wanna weep sometimes when I think about it, that it's it's done so well and, how, and connected with so many people. And like a lot of the music, it's the same thing, I'm humbled by it a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. I worked hard towards it, but I didn't expect it to be like this. No, that's incredible. It's an incredible video. I had a chance to watch it a few times. And of course, you know, seeing the work on social media. So it is quite an accomplishment. Um, I believe you had a showing here in Toronto at one of um, Toronto's festivals as well. That's right. Yeah, we were here. Well, there's a bunch of them actually that just happened in the, in the last little while, but it was so neat um, to see it like at the Carlton on a big screen and then it's question answer talking to the audience about it and people like it, it like that's the thing it's like it's surreal almost like and 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 i'm just like a regular person you know like i like i said i just want to grow food cut my lawn talk to my neighbors hang out with my family just just simple things right so that whole world for me is you know potent but at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of myself all the time that like, I'm just a farmer. I'm here with the amazing, talented Ed Roman. Ed, thank you so much. So we left off earlier talking about um, Red Omen and that it was showcased at one of Toronto's film festival. Um, what was that experience like for you? Well, like I was saying, it's, 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 it's surreal. Because, you know, it, you're, you're, first of all, accepted into the festival. And that feels really great. Like I said, mm -hmm. anything that you do that feels like you're connecting is huge. And then, you know, you're in Toronto at a well-known old theater like the Carlton. It's on a big screen. There's tons of people in the room. And they're watching what's going on. And you're sitting there, you know. And it's, it, yeah, I, I, I'm almost speechless and and right. know, knowing that it's it's doing that and then it, that it wins an award through that process as well it and then question and answer talking about like uh, again how the, the the video was made why i wrote the song you know what 
what it's done, its purpose. Uh, it, I, it, it's such a wonderful feeling because like, it's like growing a garden again, for me, uh, I, I, I hate seeing food go to waste mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, 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 and effort. I know we, sometimes we fail at the things that we try and sometimes it's out of necessity because we're, we're learning something in that process. I have failed in gardening because of weather. There's things that will destroy what I have done nice. and, and I have no choice and I have to work harder at rebuilding something in some way. And, and music has that same process when you can, see it work and share it and and reap like reap the reward of happiness like you mentioned the single that that part of of things like it's so it's so easy to to pay for something that you think may be materialistically placating you through some happiness it's okay to do that like you know whatever it may Mm -hmm. be but but when you can create something simplistically out of your hands because you had this thought you know, and you decided to start scribbling and write a song and get into it and feel something from it and feel a connectivity to it. It's special. It's special, you know. Uh, and, and as I say, to, to know that it's played at so many festivals, even like in my own hometown, I, more so for me, like it's great because like I'm getting the acclamation. People are like, Ed, you wrote the song. And people are talking to me. I'm doing interviews. It's in books. I mean, there was they ran it in like billboard magazine there was a clip about it from an emerging artist it's like huge but ultimately it's like knowing the attention is always being directed to the dyslexic society and helping kids yes because when i was there i didn't have that thank god i had a mom that when the school said hey you know what we want to put your son on rhythm because he's hyperactive my mom went Mm -hmm. no you know, he loves to learn and he's a passionate young man. So let's not suppress that. And she took it upon herself, like with my sister, who has issues too with reading. Uh, and she's ambidextrous. She can write with two wow. hands at the same time. The, she just worked with us. And to every today, to this day, I still say to my mom, Mom, thank you. You know why? And thank you because you wanted to be a mom. Mm-hmm. You wanted to be a parent. At what age um, were you um, diagnosed or, you know, what's, at what age did you realize that you have this gift? Let's put it that way. Seven, about seven. And then I went for this special testing and it was about a week and a half of it. And then the doctor said, yeah, he's dyslexic. Um, and that's what's going on. And, and people thought at first at school, he's like, no, I, I need glasses. I need glasses now because of my age. <laughs> yeah. um, sound like Groucho Marx, but. Uh, at the same time, I, it, I, I, school for me was about like, again, three dimensional connectivity. I broke the rules. I was snuck in through the school window to where this piano was that we couldn't access because the door was locked. And I started playing at recess and got in trouble, you know, like, but it was, it was good trouble. I, I, it was, it was, I was so excited about wanting to touch those instruments that I thought to myself even as a young kid I was like you know to the teacher you're crazy because I'm not in there lighting matches I'm playing a piano you know what I mean like so I I, I've I've always found music to be so artistically you know delinquent (laughs) in a way right Mm because it's it's eccentric also too in some ways it allows you to break out of out of the the shell, even the 21st century shell, to be what you want to be. Character can come through music. So often when I'm playing live, I'm driven by the character of the song, no different than I'm pulled by the catalyst of the idea of a song through it. I'm being asked questions instead of trying to figure it out myself. It's asking questions of me, just like when I'm performing the song, how am I feeling? What am I going through this process? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it's artistic almost in nature too. It allows you, like I say, to break out of your shell, you know? That's cool. Did you, um, you talked about getting in trouble with the piano. Were there any challenges that you faced as a young adult or as a child growing up as a result of um, your gift? Well, summer school was hard because, mm-hmm. you know, I was there a couple of years and that was really a drag. That was like, you know, I wanted to be with my friends tutoring. I had four years of tutoring. 
Um, and that was after school. Plus, like I said, my mom, especially when I was younger, but that was all the time with my mom. I was always doing more work than most kids just to maintain a B or C plus average. Yeah. But I, I excelled in other ways where, like, I remember, like, I love history and anthropology and I had some great teachers in, in high school and some not so good teachers in high school, but the ones I loved, I loved having conversations in class and asking questions. And I remember like I could talk about so many things that I had learned, but when it came time to expressing myself on a written test, I would get docked so many spelling marks that it, I would, you know, I'd have the right answer, but I would, you know, almost yeah. fail the test right and and it, it occurred to me even as a teacher that you know uh, i i can correct a student for whatever it may be but i also know they have to learn in their own way i could say well yeah, put your fingers like this or use this kind of a pattern or, or think about it more this way i don't want to tell them directly what to do especially if they know what they want to do but but you know school can be very rigid that way in the academic system and I think it needs to have more you know like I say this I've talked to the president of the dyslexic society a number of times this three-dimensional aspect to to the learning and education process the the Davis method is accepted by 56 nations around the world and funded through federal or systems that are local but not in Canada and not in the United States where it was developed. So that's why they go through big fundraising programs every year in the U.S. and, and here in Canada. So, you know, again, I think you got to think artistically about everything to try to make things work. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's what's interesting is that I'm finding more and more studies now focusing on students who are engaged in the arts you know, they tend to perform academically better, you know, than students who are, are not doing anything. So I think there is probably a nice correlation right there. Exactly. You hit it a thousand percent on the head. And that balance is essential. I remember when I was a kid in grade school, about 1975, 76, I was in kindergarten. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, you know, by, by grade three, you know, I'm going to be in band, like we had band with like instruments and like a drum set and a, and a wow. bass guitar and all this stuff in our grade school system, in the Catholic system. And, and all of a sudden in 1977, they got rid of it because of funding issues and they just thought it wasn't there. We played recorder and ukulele and things like that, choral stuff, singing, we did plays, but I was devastated when, when I didn't have that opportunity, um, and, and I think that, that that balance for me was a struggle all through grade school, because no matter what I did when I got home and I had homework to do or reading, I spent every other waking moment I could trying to play an instrument or mm -hmm. write a song. So that balance is important. For me, it was important to keep myself happy. Right, you know, right. like you said, like you said, it's so important to find that balance. I think the same thing goes with agriculture. I think kids should start you know, <laughs> growing things in school, right? You might be onto something there. <laughs> hey, we could start something, Alethea. We're on to it, you know. Awesome, awesome. I love it. Um, you mentioned the Davis method. Can you explain a little bit what that is? I'm not familiar with the term. Well, uh, Ron Davis is a sculptor, and he himself is a dyslexic. So many, many years ago, he developed this sort of process of, of process of reading, but also using sort of the three dimensional aspect of the information in a different way. In it's terms of not not memory and comprehension, but what like with my mom, some of the things that we had to do were really slow ourselves down. And when we slowed ourselves down, it gave us time to think more about what each sentence, paragraph, phrase, or whatever linguistically they were trying to say. A dyslexic mind, and what a whole bunch of dyslexics are in a room, it's like blah, 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 because we're, we're firing so fast a lot of the time right. that, that we're, it's like a little epiphany after a little epiphany. And and what the dyslexic Davis method does, excuse me, I'm see, I'm tripping over my own words, is it allows you to do that. And then like with my mom, ironically, go through these exploratory conversations about the word or what more of the meaning of all of this is. Consequently, 
what you almost end up developing more so is a photographic memory. Oh. People say, how do you remember so many lyrics? How do you know how to memorize all that stuff? It's through this process that it allows to filter through a number of times so it sticks in a completely different way. And I don't think it's better or worse than anything else. It's just we learn differently through that process. So also, like, for instance, when a dyslexic comes across a large word that they may not understand, phonetically, they may understand what's happening. The phonics are there. But putting the word together and having a dip, difficult time putting that word together forces the process to slow down. Hence, you may lose the comprehensive process in learning what the sentence is trying to say. Then you have to go through it a second or third time and then boom, you've got it. So that's why I would say, you know, I spent a lot of extra time trying to keep up with this process that was always demanding of something academically of me in school, whether it was reading chapters or something in science or trying to write an essay or all of that stuff. But but again, my experience as a teacher and, and talking even about dyslexia with students that aren't dyslexic. But it, again, sort of illustrates a different three-dimensional thinking process. Even with music, you can see it as very clinical and flat. Wow. And, and, and if you see music outside of that realm to allow the instrument that you're working on to become an extension of yourself, just like words mm -hmm. in a conversation that is just happening out of the blue, one of those porch chats that like, and you know, I loved that as a kid, you know, growing up hearing conversations between adults. I love that. So, you know so what, Ed, I'm going to cut you right there. I hate to yeah. cut you mid sentence, but we need to take a break. <laughs> so, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to have to have you on another time so that we can finish this conversation. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks. I just don't shut up. <laughs> no, that's okay. No worries. Thank you so much. Join you're us welcome. next time for another episode of In Conversation with Alethea.